Podcast. Thunder Green Podcast is brought to you by SoccerNight.com, your source for all the Dallas U.S. national team and their national gear. Shop all the latest U.S. men's national team gear, including the new home and away jerseys, pre-match tops, and jackets at SoccerNight.com. And as a Thunder Green listener, you get 20% off both in-store and online with the code Third Degree. So use code Third Degree, SoccerNight.com, in person, whichever one you want. Some exclusions may apply. Third Degree of the Podcast is also brought to you by the Lindstrom Law Firm. For wills, trusts, probates, and business law, call 469-515-2559. That's 469-515-2559. Or visit lindstromlawfirm.com for a free consultation. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Welcome to episode 258, 258 of Third Degree the Podcast. Howdy. Tis me, Peter. No Dan again this week. Very busy growing a beard, we're told. And uh, that means it's just me and the original editor, founder of Third Degree, the podcast, and Mr. Soccer Influencer himself, Buzz Carrick. Come in, Buzz. Peter, I don't know how more beautiful or bushy big the Dan's beard can get. I mean, things are already got it. It's on the social security number. It does. It's pretty crazy. And it's it's not a length thing; it's a density thing. Yeah, <laughs> you know he ain't playing around with that thing. No, I'm sure he like puts his car keys in there when he's at work or you know, <laughs> at the grocery the store or something. Yeah, something <laughs> yeah. like that. He may have like a small hedgehog uh, yeah. nesting in there. <laughs> probably, or... probably a squirrel more than a hedgehog. But yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, we miss you, Dan. Come back soon. Okay, Buzz. Uh, where are we on the? Burn temperature scale after the donut draw up in St. Louis, which I think, I think we're all going to go, phew. <laughs> and if we just want to be positive about it, wow, we are so lucky to have Martin Paws on this team. Yeah, I think I'm looking forward to the start of the regular season next month uh, now that we've got all this preseason stuff out of the way. <laughs> yes, listen, honestly, if Martin Paws doesn't have, doesn't tie his career. MLS career high with seven saves. Uh, that's a butt kicking by um, good Lord. St. Louis. Why is my brain not working? St. Louis. I was about to say Seattle. I'm like, no, that's the next game by St. Louis. It's an S team. Uh, that's how befuddled I am by this whole thing. Um, now there's some positives. I, you know, I think we could talk about one or two positives, but um, you know, if, if, if Martin, I Paz, dare you. Yeah. Mar- I mean, I voted for Martin Prosser player of the week and he made team of the week. On a, you know, a team that's horrible right now. So that's, um, you know, that shows you how good everybody around the re- league thought he was and recognized with his performance, you know, and, and that's opposite Berkey too, who was also good, you know, and, and that's the, for Berkey to have been good, that meant Dallas must have gotten into him a little bit. So that is the small positive, which we'll come back to. But in the meantime, it's like, you know, I, I know coach wants to talk about um, getting a point and positivity and, how they did this and that and the other thing, but it's like, man, when a team you're playing has 20, depending on which stat machine you look at 26 or 27 shots, which by the way, I looked it up. That's the most shots by an opponent in the Nico Estevez era. Mm -hmm. So that's great. You know, if they don't shoot it like at a 25% clip on goal, you know, and if pause doesn't have seven saves, which is a remarkable performance, that's a slaughtering. So it's hard to get too excited about it. Well, there was just I, the whole team, um, by and large, was just pretty poor. And St. Louis is a team that likes to uh, uh, insert their will upon you, but they have not had a good start to the season themselves. And as good as Paz was, man, there was some really poor finishing on on St. Louis's part too yeah, yeah, that yeah. plays plays into this. I think the other big talking point out of this game was the surprise in the starting eleven that Tafari was not in the starting 11 and the the explanation given to us was um that it, he wasn't in his best moment i think steve davis tweeted out and i yeah that, that's the language a coach used yeah yeah and i uh, uh, is and then steve wrote a really interesting interesting article um uh and a couple of days later where 
you know, uh, Steve and, you know, somebody who's relatively close to the team, like Steve says, look, there's nothing about this. It's just Nico playing the long game. And I guess he's insinuating that means it's a rest thing. Like we just don't want to wear mm. him out. And I, and I don't know, man, something just smells odd about this. No, I'm going to, I'm going to go a different way than what, um, than that conjecture with what Steve wrote. I think, um, you know, every, every coach has different language they use. Um, Oscar used to say, you got to have everybody rolling in the same direction, you know, pulling in the same direction, however you want to, he, he would say it different ways, different times, but it's the same principle. The idea that like, everyone's got to be on board. And so to me, you know, like for a player to not be in a good moment, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, form. Maybe it does. Maybe it means form. But, you know, form is related to confidence. It's related into belief. It's related into mentality. It's related into being on the same page as everybody else. And I think in this game, we saw a whole lot of like some fight from FC Dallas, right? There was some there was some clapping of hands together. There was some like, yeah, let's go. Come on. You know, that kind of stuff. I can't tell you that the week before, Last week, um, on the Wednesday when I was there, when practice ended, um, Nikosi was the first person walking off the field, and he was by himself, and he had his, you know, grimacing kind of face and a, and a, and a level of, you know, um, discontent expressing. He when was this? This was the Wednesday before. Ah, okay. A week ago, basically. You know, at that point, did he know he would be sad? Um, is that mentality, that, that way he was expressing himself on that day, was that part of why he got sad? You know, because that's what, to me, this is, he got sat for a game. Um, you know, there, there, there's a, uh, if you look back at all the goals, there were some moments when, you know, um, he has not done well. And some of the goals have come from guys he was supposed to be covering. You know, if his, at the beginning of the season, he was very vocal and very much calling people out. And then that has tailed off a little bit as he's kind of lost you know, maybe lost some belief that they, you know, or has recognized that there's pieces missing and how, and how much trouble they're in. So, you know, reading all that stuff was how I took it to mean, um, this idea that like, that he was in a, he was in a bad way or he was in a bad moment, that that's kind of what it meant, you know? And it's like, you know what? And, and the idea that you're going to sit him for a game to help the long play, is a recognition that, yeah, in, in pure terms, he's a better player than, right now than Omar Gonzalez is, but I need to give him a kick in the tish. I got to wake him up a little bit. You know, I'm mm -hmm. going to sit him for a game and it's going to be like, okay, are you going to be with us or not? You know, that's the way I took it all. Um, it, it's possible I'm wrong. I'm not in the locker room, but, you know, the, the way the team sort of responded a little bit in terms of fighting together and the way that, you know, both Steve and coach said, you know, no, it's going to be a, there was direct quotes from Nico that Steve had where he says, it's just going to be a thing, a game, you know, and, and people, and, and Steve even had some mention of somebody saying that it was hope they work it out. And Steve said, there's nothing to work out. It's like, it's just coach player, you know, trying to get his player going. And, and in the press conference today, Nico even said that he still thinks Nikosi can be a much better defender than he is, you know, that he's got some things he needs to work out, you know, on the mental side of the game, um, you know, that'll to make himself even better. So uh, uh, putting all that together, I think this is just a, I'm hoping one game benching, you know, cause, um, uh, while Omar played pretty well, I don't think giving up 27 shots is ideal. And then I think there's a more, obviously it's more than just the one guy though, that leads to that level of shots. And I think we should talk about some of that, some of that stuff, but yeah, we will yeah, get into I'm that. I'm expecting, you know, I, to me, this was a one game benching and you know, we'll, and if Nikosi responds how he should respond, or Elon hopes he will respond, and again we're doing we're doing a lot of speculating here because we're not inside the locker room. These are hard to call sometimes, but that's what I see. And and how quickly he's back will tell us a lot. I think, in fact, yeah, it's the idea that you're sitting the guy for the long haul, and and the sense that it had something to do with saving his legs. And maybe I'm reading into that. Maybe that's not what Steve was inferring. Um, it seems weird to me. This this does, in fact, I'm with you, Buzz. I think this feels like a coach trying to make a statement with the guy. And ultimately, we'll see how this plays itself out. I mean, it's just a function of time. Does he start this weekend? And if he does this start this weekend, how well does he play? How does he respond? Does he not start this weekend? And clearly, if he doesn't start, then there's something else going on. Uh, that we're that somebody's going to have to explain to us at some point. So yeah, yeah. everybody's yeah. just going to have to sit tight. We've look. We've been watching this team a long time. We've seen these things happen before. If I if I if I wasn't lazy enough to if, if I had been 
let me put it this way. If I had put a little more thought into it, I probably could conjure up four or five other scenarios like this over the last 30 years where somebody got sat because attitude issue or not playing well, form issues or something like that. I'm sure you could probably do one off the top of your head, Buzz. Yeah, I mean, you can. You know, you can look back at um, Graziani. Um, Durr, Durr threw, threw him out of practice, you know, and didn't start him. And uh, I'm sure probably Chad Deering also. Those are two very strong will players. I can't specifically think of Chad um, being benched, but I know that there were some definitely some conflicts at certain times between him, him and Durr. Um, Shellis and um, at the end with um, the, the defender. Um, uh huh. Daniel Hernandez? No. Oh, well, yeah. Daniel Hernandez. That was after Daniel retired to become a coach. No, the um, the national team guy in 2010 when they had a falling out and he was suspended for like the final. Heath Pierce. Yeah. So, you know, he, he and Shellis definitely had a falling out and, and, and Heath Pierce definitely was sat. Zimmerman? Know, and Oscar? Um, uh, yeah, Oscar and Zimmerman for sure. Or even um, that left back that they brought in that Oscar hated so much. He was like, after like a week, he was like, get rid of this guy. This guy's <laughs> awful, you know? And then he guy never came back. Um, yeah. You know, so there definitely have been uh, situations like that for sure. You know, I, I think one of the things to understand about coach Nico is that he's always publicly uh, 99% positive. He's very, very unlikely to rip a guy or say this guy's crap or that was a, you know, you could you have to go read between the lines and see when he says things like about like a goal, like we didn't know we had a bad moment, we did this that wasn't so great. You know, uh, when you talk about players on the roster, he'll say, you know, everybody that's on the roster we think can help us, which is co speak for like we got rid of the bums we didn't have before, but there's still guys that aren't really ready. So, you know, when you're talking about a coach who's never going to really blast a guy, for him to say that a guy's not in his best moment is pretty telling, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Uh, it's weird, and again, we could probably dig into this a whole lot more, but uh, I think the best way to handle this is just keep an eye on it and see what happens yeah. over the course of the next game or two. We'll learn a whole lot more. In fact, there, one of two things happens. It continues to get worse, and we all start asking a whole lot more questions either mm -hmm. about the coach or Nikosi, or B, Nikosi comes out and has a great game, and we all forget about it. Yeah, keep in mind, too, that on a bad team, you know, coach is trying to – keep a hold of the locker room, keep a hold of the team. And, and if he thought, you know, again, we're doing a lot of conjecturing. If he thought that Nikosi being a very vocal guy, a very strong-willed guy, a very outspoken guy, if he thought Nikosi was going against him a little bit, again, this comes back to Oscar's idea of you got to have everybody rolling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it was like, hey, I'm still the coach here. You're not starting, you know. And so, so again, we're, we're pulling a lot of things out of thin air trying to make – understand what's happened but you know this is the idea when things happen with this team and that with there's no and there's no clear and obvious explanation we're left sometimes trying to figure out the best we can with the evidence we have and, and and as you say what happens next will be very telling in terms of like both what was the problem to begin with and which direction it's going to go third degree your prime source for speculation <laughs> it is a podcast after all <laughs> Let's call it educated guesses or spot speculation, you know. Okay. All right. Uh, sometimes yeah. we know things we can't talk about. Huh? huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> I just did the I just did the weird dog look when yeah. you, <laughs> that yeah. they yeah. give you when they don't understand what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna that looks like a very hot third rail. I'm not mm. gonna touch it. Yeah, don't touch uh, that. Uh, yeah. so uh, so let's just talk about how crappy the team in general is because uh -huh. good grief watching this team is just it's painful to watch but i don't know how this team went from two seasons ago being really exciting to watch to last season being just really boring to watch to this season just being really bad yeah well uh, to give you an indication of bad in this in this game um both of these teams uh, here, here's the one little positivity of the whole thing is both these teams had a roughly about the same xg it was just under two for both of them if that's your jam the xg jam and for, you know, they both got kind of shut out, but looking at the other team, looking at St. Louis to have this, they had a 1.9 XG and they didn't score any goals. So in a way, like to, to hold, uh, that's effectively two, to hold a team with an XG of two to zero is, uh, you know, performing above that level. You're doing a better job of stifling things than the other team did. You know, and you're giving yourself some positivity there. And that, again, comes to me back to pause. You know, that that number, that being of almost two um, goals better than the XG is one of the best 
performances under Nico too. So that's to me that reads as a resiliency, a, a don't give upness. So I like that. Um, and then on the other end, for Dallas to have gotten, you know, close to that kind of uh, XG also means that something was at least clicking a little bit. Now they shot at a much better like fifty percent shot on target to to uh, shot ratio, which we always talk about is really really important for this team. Because this is not a low, this is not a high volume shot team. So a good fifty percent rate is really good for them. That's really positive. And I think you can look at the blossoming, if you will, and craziness. Uh, that the fact is that um, Eugene Ansa, of all people, is most meshing with uh, Petter Musa, <laughs> and like that combo <laughs> looks like the best combo we've seen all season, which is crazy. Now that leaves you one third spot. That's not, but. You know, maybe that's a spot for Jesus or whatever. You know, and you sometimes you have to take what little victories you can. And maybe it's the fact that both guys are, you know, um, at least somewhat used to like a different level, different kind of league. Maybe they're recognizing how to play with each other a little better with this kind of high striker system that people here maybe are not used to yet. The other young wingers Dallas has don't really know how to do that. Jesus maybe doesn't really know how to do that. So. It's interesting to watch. Yeah, I didn't have uh, Ansa meshing with Musa on my bingo card for yeah. this season. So I know, that right? Is a, that, that is a good one. Um, but it's pretty clear that's what's happening to me. I mean, I, those two guys look better together and more on the same page than anybody else does that's played in that underneath role with Ansa yeah. there, you know. And at times it rotated. That was an interesting twist. It was like Ansa took multiple turns like up high, even with him, and turned it into a, you know, the, the typical 3 5 2 look where you have the, the 10 underneath. Uh, in this last game, it was legit, you know, as the 10 underneath with two guys up above. Uh, again, another option that might look good with Jesus and some of those possibilities. So, Yeah, I think the most disconcerting part of this game is the reality that with Paxton out for the year and Alara Mendy out for this particular game, and we'll talk more about him in a minute, is what they're left with. The leftover options in the middle of the field yeah, is no. just a gaping wound. Mm. It's just it's really, really poor and a better team, which there are many of in this league than St. Louis probably just crushed this team uh, nine times out of 10 uh, Dallas again, because of pause and some poor Seattle finishing. I mean, a Seattle St. Louis finishing. I got really fortunate in this particular one, but uh, the middle of the field is a significant, significant ongoing long-term problem. I'll go further than that. Uh, you know, I have in front of me the, the team from this game. And let's just talk about it for a second. Y y yes, Moose is a $10 million player, but he needs a little service. That's fine. That's a good player. It's a new player. We're excited about that. Eugene Otza was the other guy. He's from the Israeli league, right? Yeah. Uh, which is, and he's getting paid like O'Brien got paid. He's getting paid like a backup number. So that's like a roster piece kind of backup piece. That's like a key guy, right? The other guy was legit who's now over 30 and is not really a 10. You know, he was always a wing or like a wide mid or like a deeper, you know, like he's sort of playing in this particular game. He's sort of playing out of position. He was really terrible last year. You're hoping he can have a rebound. At best, he's like, let's not say he's a reclamation project, but he's a little bit of a hoping he can find his form back project, right? Mm -hmm. So again, not a top in like sweet, locked in, great piece right now, right? Okay, Ariola played wing back. <laughs> again, not his spot, right? You're putting a guy in a weird thing, trying to get him to do a weird job. A guy had a horrible season last year, a captain, a good leader and all that stuff, but you know, out of sorts, not standard, not normal, right? Okay. Across the middle, Delgado, a U 22 player. He's 20 years old. He's got like one cap with his national team. Again, supposed to be a project, supposed to be an idea that like you're going to build around the guy. And yet he's having to start right away out the gate. Frazier, he was playing in like he got cut by MLS teams before this. He's a Canadian fringe international. He's been playing in low level Europe, right? Again, not a dude you're building around. Dante Seely, a homegrown who Dallas tried to loan off to PSV and got rejected, and now he's back and he's playing at the beginning of the year almost because there was nobody else. And at best, he's a project. Ibiaga, how many times have we talked about this? He never had started only one season in his life, and he and he started more MLS games than fifteen. He's a journeyman backup or a USL player, right? Omar is 35. Sam Junka is a career roster filler. Kind of, I love Sam Junka, but he is not a frontline center back starting 20 games. Okay, pause is great. So you got two dudes out of this 11 <laughs> that are supposed to be like a substantial frontline MLS starter. It's literally 
a team of backups plus Paul Ariola playing out of position. Oh, Buzz, you know what that reminded me of? You well, going it's a miracle that? it was zero to zero. <laughs> well, that reminded me in high school when I turned into a, a paper and I did such a poor job of doing the work that the teacher sat down with me after class and went through error by error yeah. with me and essentially just humiliated me to death. That's awful, Buzz. That's I know. It, yeah, I was just concerned about the two center mids, but you're right. The whole it's thing. It's the whole is, thing. The whole thing is, and 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 here's what I think is most problematic: is yeah, you can say, well, guys, they've they've got injuries, but let's start putting the injured pieces back into place, and let's see what the how many changes you end up with. You end up essentially with Jesus for Lejet. Maybe probably or Jesus yeah, right for Ansa, Maybe yeah. If we're talking I, okay. this game, yeah, yeah. Well, All right, yeah. Uh, the next one, and again, you can't count Paxton because he's done for the year. I don't think that's you know. So Farfan goes in for Junka. Does he? Farfan has not played a single game all year. Okay, he Even goes when in, he was healthy. Right, and uh, who else is injured that I'm forgetting? Ilar Mendy is going to come back for either. Oh Frazier yeah, obviously. Auto. Okay, so that's the big one. Is Ilar Mendy? I mean, obviously, Paxton is a big miss, but now he's yeah. gone for the entire season. I'm just pointing out that when the guys that will be coming back are healthy, you still have. Now, the other two pieces are the most are the ones that really are what is, are going to hinge this season on, which is Velasco and uh, Giovanni Jesus. If those guys are even if there's any chance either one of those dudes come yeah. back this yeah. season, four out of those five names are million dollar players. And one of them is your U twenty two initiative. He paid a lot to get, right? So it's like you know, you got you got Mowers on the bench is a is a long term is a thirty five year old like in the dying days of his career. Great dude, but you know he's not going to lift you up. Okay, Nikosi comes back. That's nice. Ber Bernie's a nice uh, piece we think, but in this system he's a mess because he has no idea what to do. Tumasi's a you know journeyman solid outside back, but not. Sparkling, uh -oh. he's a converted anything. attacker. He's yeah. not. He's not even a natural defender. Right. right. That's just a. That's a. You know, nice guy, good piece, but not. Not like going to change anything. Siki, come on, Carl Sante, who I have an interesting future for, but not there yet. Endale, come on, he's played like three games. Farrington's a cool draft pick, but seems to be losing out to people like Legette and Hansa, and then Solly, who can't get off the even into the first team bench if he's if we're not missing like eighteen pieces, so. You know, it's just like people wonder why this team's at the bottom of the, the league. It's 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 not just the injuries, the same as it always. I know we hate to be this dark, but I mean, how many times have we sat here in this podcast, Peter, over the years or the website or whatever, and talked about the fact that if you yeah. if you hold Pat in this league, you're going to get passed up. You cannot you cannot just sit on what you have. You know, and they do change things, but the pieces they brought in are like they they move out a high paid veteran for like a like a project or a journeyman like guy we're going to plug in it's like none of these things are like you know where are the you know farrington's a good draft pick but like there's been really hardly any others going back to nikosi like set what seven years ago now where's the homegrowns that are missing you know where's these the u22 initiatives have not come through you know giovanni's hurt so maybe he would have but solly so far is like whatever you know it's uh it's not good you know? yeah it's like if if you just stayed a hundred percent healthy, your big time players could have carried you into the top half of the Western Conference, which is what we predicted at the beginning of the year. We should have factored in injuries though, and we didn't. You know, so we played the same risk the team did. Yeah. I also want to point out that uh, you, you know the the reality is, is is that they knew going into the season, two of their key critical starters were coming off ACL injuries and they did essentially nothing to cover for those guys. Yeah. And I, you know, I keep hearing that the club and in, insists that they're going to be back this season. Now they may be back in terms of uh, they may get time, but you can't, you can't assume or trust that either one of those guys is going to be up to speed coming off an ACL. And I thought what else, what was kind of interesting this week is the club put out some new content, which is, what is it? The road to recovery. Allen's. Yeah. Allen's well, I don't thing, know yeah, what yeah, Allen's yeah. thing, you know, it's so they, if you haven't seen it yet, they put out like a three minute video on social of it's Allen nice. well done. back in town. Yeah. Very well done and all yeah. this. But what's interesting is in the three minute deal, an interview with the club's own trainer says, <laughs> yeah, this is basically a year, a yeah. year long project. I know. <laughs> 
Oh, so, and so if much. I'm remembering correctly, Alan yeah. Velasco went out like at the first leg of the first round of the playoffs. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, nine nine months. If you get if you're really quick healer, nine months is you can come back from that, which is August. Yeah, have you seen the video of Alan yeah. no, uh, no, no. around? Yeah, 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 I saw it. I saw it. Yeah. Have you seen that scar on his knee? Yeah. yeah. It doesn't look like he's get, he's he's anywhere close to being ready to play anytime soon. Bless his heart, and I hope miracle yeah. upon miracles he is. But I I just don't know how you put a season together and 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 work off the assumption that Alan Velasco is playing at any level for you in the yeah. 24 season. I just, I don't think that's fair to your fans. I don't think that's fair yeah. to Allen. I don't think that's fair to the rest of the team. That's just really, really poor roster management in, in my eyes. Yeah. We, we have to alter our expectations because I, I think having seen Vancouver earlier than this year, having watched a little of LA or Salt Lake or the teams that are at LAFC, you expect to be good. You know, think about the FC Dallas roster and who on this roster would you expect to walk into another MLS team and be a surefire lock starter. I mean, pause on like most of them, but there's still probably four or five teams he would not. And then, oh yeah, this is would, always a, a would, fascinating exercise, right? Would Would Musa walk into every other team in the league and start? Not everyone, for sure. No, many of them, but not Pro- probably, probably half. Yeah. Half would be fair. Two thirds, maybe yeah. even. Yeah. Uh, Yarmendi, uh, if he's healthy, probably. But that's about it. A uh, Jesus. If Jesus was healthy, Jesus probably would too. There's yeah. still only four people out of because I don't think Paxton would. Not not on half. Far right. Yeah, I I would have said last year coming into this year, I would have expected it would have been about eighty percent of the teams he would. But I don't know about based on his waste playing this year. And I would think it's other, best it, not. You know, something I also thought about this whole Tafari thing, which is if if the contention is he's not playing very well. Well, uh, can I just wonder how much of that is him being asked to play in a three-man back line after, I think, for the majority of his career playing as a yeah, uh, one and a two? Possible. I just think it's probably more about uh, – that's why I think it's more about um, something else. It's not necessarily about his play. Or it is about his play, but in a way that's not like – it's not that he doesn't understand. I think it's about intensity. You know, because Coach last week we talked about intensity. We saw some intensity in this game. Like when I talked to him last week, coming out of the game before, he was he talked about how nobody won any duels. Remember, and I even told a story about um, Musa when I said he was my man of the match because he won fifty percent of his aerial duels, and like the next best person was Ima Tuomasi. Right. And it's like that. I'll tell you all you know that they're like they're getting just beat to these crosses. It's not like they're not challenging them; they're just getting beat to them. And so that's mentality. That's like, that's like worth me. And that's to me, that's the, when he came back around to the idea that Nicosi was in a bad spot, that all resonated with me. The fact he's not winning these duels. And so that's where I think he is at. I don't think it's the th- adjustment to the three. I think it's just, you got to be a warrior and be out there. Just, you know, this coach loves, we've talked about this all the time, right? This coach loves warriors more than he loves, you know, pretty boys. He likes these guys that are just going to fight and claw and scratch and kill people to win. Isaiah Parker's a pretty boy. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, like, think think about like even Martin Paz. Like he, you know, the the game before Martin Paz hadn't been great, and I'm sure he probably said something to him because after this game, he talked about in the press conference, he talked about how Paz was did what he needed to do. And yeah. so it was the Paz of old. It's like, man, if you're asking your guy to make seven saves a night, you're not going to get very far. But yes, Paz was amazing. Mm-hmm. So, well, uh, look. You always getting a point on the road is always good, no matter how you do it. Especially it is, when it you're is. in a bad shape and bad form, and you'd only had one point in five games, and you were already teetering on the on the edge of having the worst start to a season in a club's history that's been around for almost thirty years. So, yeah. look, you got out with the point. Uh, you get to move on to the next game and hope things get better and people get healthier. So uh, let's I mean, feel it, good about that. It, it, considering we were worried about, we were having conversations about, is the coach losing the team? Is he losing the locker room? For them to show some grit and heart means to me that he hasn't yet. So that's my positive takeaway in terms of like the state we're in right now. I mean, okay. if you want the coach out, then you probably didn't, weren't happy about that they did. Showed some fight and resiliency, but... They did, and that's a good thing if you're talking about trying to win one game at a time, which is what you're going to be doing at this point. Mm. Well, uh, as with anything that happens with the burn, uh, luck is never on its side. And here comes the Seattle <laughs> Sounders, who started at an even worse clip than Dallas, yet just turned around and dropped I another know. MLS Team 5 nothing the other day. And I will repeat what I put on Twitter here. 
I can't tell you how fucking pissed off I am about how good those Seattle kits are. They are so perfect. Oh God. Yeah. Gosh, I love those Seattle kits so very so much. So good. God, yeah. they're so good. And I hate it. I hate it. I hate it to my it's very It's definitely core. the best in MLS this season, and it's got to be up there for best all time. It is spectacularly it's good. easily a top three all-time yeah. MLS kit. Yeah, it is. And yeah. it, and if they if they make the stupid decision to get away from this colorway of this new green and this new blue, yeah. uh, boo on Seattle. Yeah. That would it's be a so terrible. Good. It's such a good look. Yeah, and it's sure. so much better than the the uh, neon colors. That oh they yeah, had previously. the rave green or whatever that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess I should be saying, uh, since I don't like Seattle, I hope they go back to the crappy colors. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can admire a good kid even if it's not your team. Yeah. Just like I can admire how Manchester United kits are always friggin' amazing, even though I hate them. Uh, so Buzz, you did not go to practice on Wednesday because yeah. of the weather. So you did go to practice today and no, did I did you? not today. Oh, oh, you had right. a press conference today. The, you had yeah. a press conference and you got to, yeah. uh, I can't go on Thursday. Thursdays are blocked. Right. Yep. So what did you learn in Nico's press conference today? Well, uh, some of the stuff I already mentioned, but, uh, he confirmed what I had re- tweeted earlier in the day that I had heard. Uh, that ER Mindy has been training with the team since Sunday, which is the day after the last game when they start working with the guys that didn't play, you know. So he was back in. And coach says that if ER Mindy comes through the rest of the week unscathed, which is always important after your first week back, that he will be, you know, available for a selection. So uh, that's good. Um, same with uh, Marco Farfan, because Marco Farfan, remember late, he was supposed to be eligible. And then late last week, he had some kind of head. Injury that didn't give out a lot of specifics. I assume he just got knocked or something, or uh, maybe had a minor, uh, you know, uh, concussion protocol situation or something. So not like bad attitude. Uh, apparently, no, no. It was okay. a, it was it was on the injury report as being actually hurt. So he also is back in training, and if he comes through the rest of the week, he'll be available as well. Um, Jesus Ferreira, on the other hand, is out. Um, is not trained. Coach said Jesus <laughs> will rejoin training this Sunday. Which, you know, he always says that, but, um, you know, okay, this Sunday we'll see. Um, and I this asked will be him. what, the third week in a row he's been out? Oh, uh, God, no. He's, he's, he hasn't, uh, he's played one game. I mean, you know, oh, he's I played more than one game this season, hasn't he? I don't think so. Hold on. So you're right, it's three games. So uh, still, he's been out since March 16th was the last game he played. A month. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I asked Coach specifically about Jesus, and I said, you know, given how important he is and given the the lengthening time frame that we don't even know he's going to return, I said, you know, do you have any reservations about the way the guys have handled this injury? And he said that uh, the deal is that Jesus got a hamstring injury. I think probably everybody will remember that that's what it is. He said where it is on the hamstring is high near the end of the muscle, near where it attaches. So he said, just the tip. Just the tip. So I am not a doctor, but Nico said on the conference call, he said that because of that, they have to be more careful because it's really easy to re-injury it, re-injury, to re-aggravate it. <laughs> so some good English being spoken on this podcast. So that's why they've been particularly careful. So I'm going to take him as, as a word of that because, you know, they can't. What else are you, you going to do? Yeah, I mean, it's HIPAA <laughs> rules that the doctor's not going to tell me shit because he's HIPAA and all that stuff. So. You know, only a team spokesman can say what they can, and that's what he said. The only person that could tell me would be Jesus, but I'm going to assume that coach is not lying and this is truly the case. And if that's true, then okay, good job. You know, hopefully that means that Jesus will be really actually 100% healthy and, and get over this. Now, we're worried, of course, because, you know, all the intercore is all connected. And to go from the abductor problem to now the hamstring problem, to me, you know, leg bone connected to the hip bone, all that stuff. So um, hopefully we don't see this continue to linger with Jesus and it, it gets better. So. We'll see. Fingers crossed, because they need him bad. You know. Yes, they. Well, they. They not. Not only do they need Jesus, they need good Jesus. They, yes. they need. They need the guy to be healthy. They do. And you know, they per do. the podcast last week, the the downturn in this team coincides with his Gold Cup injury. Yes, three and goals it, since the Gold Cup and regular season play. Yes, and so you know, uh, good on you, Mister Ferreira, for getting healthy. Um, but when you get healthy, we need you to actually start producing. So. Um, to be completely Go. fair, he has one playoff goal and one League's Cup goal also. So okay. all comps, it's five. But it's in fine. league play, it's three. Uh, Farfan. When Farfan comes back, does yeah. he start 
as a center back or does he start as a winger? I don't know that he starts because he was healthy before he had this head injury and he wasn't starting. So, you know, like for whatever reason, coach seems to love Dante Seeley quite a bit, probably because in order to play wing back properly, you have to have a offensive component as we saw against, uh, I think yeah, it was but on this team, you kind of need to have a defensive component you do. as a yeah. probably as a more primary <laughs> right, right. skill set on this. Well, team. <laughs> you can't you can't leave the front line isolated. You got to create the offensive width, or the thing falls apart. But um, you know, again, you should have some defensive. I wish I could merge them together. To be honest, like Farfan is the better defensive wing back, so he could be a left center back, but he's a little shorter than Junka. Junka is the more complete two way player because you remember Junka played wing last year, even. Yeah. Right. So like for me, Junka is the one that I want to see playing wing back because he can do both of those things. Like if you had a real left center back, you could put Junka at wing back and it would really help, you know, or, or if you felt Omar was good enough, you could put Omar in the middle, put Nikosi at left center back and then put Junka out there wide. You know, whatever you had to do to me to put Junka out wide is a good idea, particularly when you're not doing really good in the back right now. You know, again, you really need a left center back. The, you actually need two center backs more than you have right now, not just one, but that's a you know, roster building and stuff. Anyway, I, I would love to see Joker get a start at left wing back. I, I don't know that Farfain is a good enough attacking winger to solve whatever it is. Because, like, yes, his work rate is great and his defensive resiliency is great. Does he do enough in the final third to make their defense stay wide and cover you? Or can they give up and go tight? That's the real question. So, you know, whether he can p- press Dante Sealy enough and get that spot or enough, you know, there were not a lot of signs that that was happening before he hurt his head this last week. Um, I thought it was more likely he'd have been in for Junka this last week than it would have been. He would have been in for um, Sealy. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's just what happens when you don't actually have real wingbacks. You're right. <laughs> you don't have yeah. Yedlin or Reynolds or, you know, uh, Dest. All of them, you know, those guys are great wingbacks. So let's Kobe talk, Jones in the day. You know. Yeah, let's talk about Dante here a little bit because obviously we went into the season knowing that he was going to get his run. We're six six games into the season, and I think on the balance, especially after that horrible miss opportunity to take a one goal uh, to take oh, the lead in Lord, the game, that was a bad miss. You know, I mean, look, the the ball flashes in. I I you know that happens at at some level, but it, he's got to finish that at this level. And uh, that was along with everything else with him that we all, I think we are all identifying that we get frustrated with. Uh, if he turns the goals in when he gets his few opportunities, then suddenly you're willing to probably uh, forgive some of the other stuff, but right. I don't know, Buzz, where are you at, at, on the Dante Seeley experience? Man, I watched I watched that game, and I watched Dante running around, and I said to myself, man, for a fast player, he is really slow. He's a loper. Yeah, he doesn't run. He's not fast. He's, he's not slow. He just yeah, doesn't. He just doesn't run. He doesn't exert himself. I know, I know. Um, I know. The thing is, is that people have been talking to him about that kind of thing since he was, as long as I've known him, since he was 15. Wow. You know, at least okay. I assume they have, because we've been talking about that about him since he was 15. I can't imagine that they're not telling him more than we are. Um, you well, know, that kind of, you know, I got to say that that somewhat, uh, 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 what's the right word? Um, hearing you say that this has been a problem dating back to him prior to him going to PSV. Yeah. Relieves, is a bit relieving because a part of me wonders if this is the story of a kid who thought he got his big break to go to Europe, was rejected, and is now back here at home having to play. And what we're seeing is a reflection of a guy that just, you know, is mm. bummed out that he blew his chance. No, because he does work hard in training. I don't think he's got that kind of mentality. He just, his whole career, as much as I've ever seen him, he he's known that he's a talented player and he knows he has skill. So he just kind of waits for, he's always just been better than everybody else. And he always has just been able to do whatever he wanted when he wanted to. So he just kind of drifts around in games. Like even in the Academy, even in North Texas, I'm like, man, why aren't you dominating this game? You're just drifting in and out of this game and having moments. He's always been this way. And I think he's finally, you know, certainly a PSV was, and MLS might be too, it's a level where you can't do that. Eventually you have to play, you know, you have to bring it. And he's not, he's not, 
you know, he has he just has these moments where he just is jogging around behind people, and you see him start to almost start to spread, and he goes, "No, nah, it's not worth it," and then he doesn't, and you're like, "Oh my god, dude, just please bust it," you know. But no, I, I honestly like things that, the way he plays frustrates me so much. I cannot believe he still starts, but you know, if you look into the stats, and if you're a stats coach. It's like, you know, short of Paul Areola, who bizarrely has the best attacking numbers on the team, Dante Seeley has the next best things, like in terms of shot creation actions and 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 key passes and, and duels won and offensively and, and like taking on players. Like, I don't have him in front of me, but last time I looked him up, which was like a week ago, he was number two in almost every category beyond Paul Areola. Now, everything's relative, of course. If he was on a really good team, his numbers would be way down the list, but he's not a really good team. So it's like if you if you put Farfan in there, he would be worse in probably every offensive category. It's just so annoying that Dante doesn't do more than he does. You know, you expect him to just rip people all the time. I'll tell you a story. I was the Dallas Cup that just happened. There's this kid who plays for the U nineteens. His name's Daniel Barron. And he's from um Chicago, I think, or Milwaukee or something. He's he recently been a Polish U eighteen. And he came back, you know, after a game or two in the Dallas Cup, he came back and he did what he has always done against better teams than I've ever seen him against. And he is very direct and he is very quick and he goes at people hard, but he doesn't quit. Like he gets to the, if he, if he goes, if he goes at you and you keep up, he goes at you again. And one run, even I'm talking about, he'll go again and again and again. He'll never give up. And he gets all the way to the end line and he has two inches of space left and he doesn't get up, give up. And he'll get the ball back across the box like, it's nine out of 10 times he goes at somebody. The guy is fearless and relentless and he goes at people hard the whole game. It's the complete opposite of watching Dante Seeley and Daniel Barron in the, in the Dallas cup was the most decisive player Dallas had. And he took them all the way to the final game before they lost. You know, he immediately got a North Texas soccer club opportunity. It came off the bench in the very next game. And this week he was in first team training. If you have the right mentality, if you have that this coach wants, which is this never quit, never stop mentality, you can do great things. If Dante had that mentality, Dante would have made it at PSV and he wouldn't be back here, but he doesn't. Right. You know, Mm. and it's a shame and I wish he did. And I don't know what it's going to take to wake him up because he's so talented. I mean, you saw those free kicks that he did in spring training and he almost had another one in this game, a free kick goal. Berkey made a great save to stop it. You know, Dante telegraphed it a little bit. But it was a nice free kick. You know, Ricky still to make a really great save. And yeah, by the way, Dante you know. C- Dante Seeley and the free kick is one of the weird, quiet curiosities yeah. out of this early season that I I don't think we've dug into enough yet. I mean, like, Moose had deferred to him, so they clearly <laughs> yeah. know that he has it in his bag. Yeah, like where you did know. this come from? Yeah, he just needs to convert one. He, he does, and he got some in the spring. But you know, like. Um, if he had the same mentality as this kid Baron, it's just like, oh my gosh, this guy would be the limit. But it's like, it, I don't, I don't know that he does, and I, and I wish it would wake him up. Every time I watch him play, I wish it would wake him up, and he doesn't. So. All right, well, uh, those amazing looking kits. Yes, the <sighs> Sounders are in town this weekend, and I, I'm just gonna go ahead and ask you to predict the lineup for Dallas. Buzzard. Well, first, did you see their their last game that when they won five zero? Rui Diaz had two. Morris scored. Roll Dan scored. It's like it's the guys that have carried them forever have woken up, you know. Did you see the pat? Have you seen the passing sequence uh, uh, video no, clip? No, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to see it. Honestly. Oh yeah, <laughs> they, I mean, sad. it was it was so top notch, <laughs> typical Seattle. Get the ball in a, in a twenty passing sequence that goes from one. I think everybody on their team touched the ball at least once, and it went from their end of the field out wide back to their side. I mean, it's just the whole thing. It's go find it. It's somewhere on the internet. Uh, well, I'm sure my boy, yeah. Jao Paolo was involved in that. Yeah, he's yeah. so good. Yes. It's frightening. Um, yeah. All right. So line up this weekend. Well, um, whack. I just whacked it. Um, well, this is a tough one. You know, the, the question becomes like, yes, I think Omar Gonzalez played pretty well, but I, I think you almost have to go to Nikosi because if you really did, bench him from his mentality or or something like that. You you can't then like discard him. You have to like go, you know what? You need to sit a game and then come back and show us what you have. Well, you got to let him come back and show you. Like if you just throw him out now, then he's going to be done. So you pretty much got to bring him back. So then the question just becomes for the, you know, did Omar play well enough to stay on the field against um, Seattle? And do you put Tafari as 
left center back, for example. And I think there's a chance, and again, I didn't go to practice, but I'm going to say there's a chance that you might because Rui Diaz is in the middle for them, right, with Rusnak underneath. But Rui Diaz is not blistering. Rui Diaz is like 500 years old, right? So <laughs> it might actually make sense. If Rui to, Diaz is 500. How old is Omar? Yeah, 600. Okay. So <laughs> I'm just saying that, like, it's not like it's um, – uh, you know, a blistering fast, like over, you know, over the top, going to make you run him down the field. Uh, Reed has is 33. It, right. It's actually more of a, it's like going up against um, fish, you know, or a, a, like um, um, uh, uh, Chicharito, right. A savvy yeah. striker, not a blistering striker. So, okay. I'm almost tempted to say, leave Omar in the middle and put uh, Nicosi at left center back, because that's where Roldan is on that side. And Morris is on the other side or vice versa. And so either one of those guys might be coming at you, you know, instead of and like let the Kosi deal with one of those guys and keep Yabiaga on the other side. I'm tempted. Now, you know, if, if Nico's like him, he normally is, then Nikosi will come back in the middle and, and it'll be Ibiaga, Nikosi, uh, Junka. I'm just really tempted to go Ibiaga, Omar, Tafari and see what happens. Because, you know, then you can put um, Junk out wide and then the other Roldan is at, out, outside back, you know, and Var- Obi- Vargas is over that way. So, you know, you can kind of like have all of a sudden I have a little more experience, you know, now you want to dictate at home, though. So probably it's still going to be Dante. I just I can't get out of my mind that I thought that Omar actually played fairly well. You know, in terms of organization. Well, that doesn't surprise you know? me. And he's a, he was yeah. look. There was a time and a day where Omar Gonzalez was a really, really good center back. Yeah. It's just that he's got a lot of miles and age on him, so he's not very fast, and you can't count on him for a bunch of games in a row because he's going to wear out. Yeah, like like if you were going against Kai Kamara or somebody like that, I'd be like, never mind. But Rui Diaz, I actually kind of like this idea. Maybe so. You guys can flip a coin there those listeners and see what you think, which one you might like it to be. Um, so cross the, you know, whether that means you can kick Dante out uh, and bring out junk over there. I don't know. It'll be one or the other. I'm sure. Um, but I'm going to say with Dante, you know, even though it could be Junka, and then you go across the middle. Yarmini is the big question. Like how confident are you that Yarmini is healthy? hundred percent healthy. Do you, can he go 45 minutes? Probably. Is he only good for 30? If he's only good for 30, he comes off the bench. But if he can go 45, because you remember they even played him when he was kind of banged up of that first game with a 45-minute limit. So would they try that again? Because you don't want to get behind. You really need to control this game early. Because if you get behind, you're in trouble. So I think I think they're going to be really tempted to play Yaramendi from the get-go if he's healthy. I mean, if he's not, it's Frazier and Delgado, and that's whatever. You know, it's what it is. Um so I think there's a chance it'll be Yarmendi and Frazier, mm. I think. Delgado hasn't beaten Frazier out yet? He, he has his moments, but then he has his bad moments too. He's just really young. Frazier's more reliable, you know, uh, but it could go either way, honestly. I mean, Yarmendi okay. is the real trick. It's like, can he go? And I, so I'm, I'm going to say that they'll start him and let him go 45 like they did before because they know how important he is. And you know how important it is to stay ahead of them. And Rustak is pretty savvy, you know. And then the other side will be um, uh, at home. I think it'll be Tua Masi. I really don't think it's – oh, let me think about that a second. It might actually be Areola again. Because, you know, again, they have, they have some nice wings on both sides, and, and Areola did a pretty good job, I thought, at wing back. So I, it wouldn't surprise me if that's, that's on the cards again. <laughs> and then, believe it or not, Musa, of course, is a lock, but and so is I think Eugene Ansa. I can't believe it. Hmm. Um, and then you have some decisions to make about Legit versus, you know, that that's the only thing. Would it make? I understand Seeking Assembling hasn't been in training either, so he must be hurt. So he's not a choice at the six. You know, Norris isn't really either. So I, I think you kind of you kind of have to decide like, did Legit do good enough as that other ten to keep uh, Paul a right wing back? And I think he, pro- I think he probably did because they, you know, like I said, they almost had an XG of two, mm-hmm. so that's pretty decent, really. So I think they'll try that again. And and Lejet gives you that ability to do that little flip flop, that little two one switcheroo up there, and keep Paul at wing back. So I think that's where you're at. A pause, of course, is an no-brainer. So 
Okay. Because uh, for uh, far fan back doesn't really do much for you, and Jesus is not back, so that's all you got. So I got a question for you because there's been yeah. a lot of discourse uh, in the last week or so about other MLS clubs doing a really good job of integrating kids from their MLS next team and their yep, academies yep. Uh, there's been, you know, obviously Philadelphia comes to mind. Um, uh, Columbus comes to mind and I'm sure there's some others that I'm not thinking of. And I, and, and then obviously people turn and look in Dallas and go, what in the world is going on? And we all know that the large part of that is Nico and Nico's hesitancy and, mm -hmm. and lack of desire to play the kids per se. But I'm interested in your perspective because I consider you the expert here. Is there, in fact, if in fact Nico's just being stubborn, it, are there kids in the system right now that are good enough that should be getting time uh, in the in the starting senior team? Well, if, if Tarek Scott hadn't had his double knee, I think he would have been in the mix. Um, and I think that the kid they just signed, Carl Sante, the Haitian center back, I think he will be, by the end of the season, I think he'll be in the mix. Um, I think he's got potential at center back. Uh, there's a kid at North Texas now named Diego Garcia. I think we've probably talked about him before. Sure we have. He uh, He's from El Paso Locomotive, and Dallas signed him he had made his senior USL debut as an amateur player, just like uh, FC Dallas does with North Texas. Um, you know, so they signed him as a pro out of that academy. So he, I don't think by rule he can be a homegrown, even though he's been here for a year or more and he's actually played academy games. I think because he was already a pro, he can't be a homegrown. So that honestly to me is the holdup on him. Because he's a very special player. He's going to be an exciting player, I think. He's in first team training from time to time. I've talked to Coach Nico about him. He loves the kid. Um, but the fact is that he can't have that protected homegrown roster spot. So it's a little harder for them to get him in. You have to give him a full. And his like, position is? Uh, he's a an 8 slash 10. Okay. He's like he's like legit, um, if you will, that kind of player. He could play as a 10. He could play as a deep eight, maybe even a little false wing. Um, but he's a really good player. Uh, I think not not the early part of this year because of the fact that the roster is difficult and figuring out how to get him into it. You, you would have to sacrifice um, somebody on the senior developmental roster. I know, you, I know we hate this roster shit. You'd have to get rid of somebody like Omar or Korcha or um, – who else is on that thing? Um, Jimmy Mauer is on that. Yeah, I, I'm just asking. Yeah. I, don't worry about the roster part. I'm just asking a more generalized question. Like, yeah, Nolan yeah. Norris, for example, or well, are Norris, there, you've are seen there, Norris. Yeah. Well, no, but I'm yeah, but yeah. what I'm asking you, Buzz, in your mind, in your uh, your opinion, are there kids that should be getting more time that just simply aren't, and they're good enough to be getting that? There's nobody right now that's good enough to come up and help FC Dallas right this minute. It's all about the future. There's this kid, Pedrinho, who's been hurt. He had compartment syndrome. They had to do that on him, if you know what that is. Um, that's what they sliced the case on your muscle like, right, yeah. on your leg. Brandon Svania had it when your leg gets constricted, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, you know, there, there's some projects in North Texas. There's nobody there that's, like, beating down the door other than maybe Diego, Diego Garcia is the closest. Okay. Um, right. And then in the academy – I'm telling you, I really like this kid, Daniel Barron, but that's a ways away. And then, then you're going down to like the 17s and the 16s, and then you get into like some really silly stuff. So the, the only answer to close up is um, the kid they just signed, Carl Sante. And then, you know, Nolan. Um, Nolan was captain of the 19s recently. You know, he was in that tournament in Morocco. You know, he, he is a really smart player. He's a phenomenal passer. It's just a matter of coach – you know, like, like in a way, I almost can't believe they signed Delgado as a U-22 initiative. No, he's not U-22 initiative. I'm sorry. He's just alone. I almost couldn't believe that they signed Delgado in the very spot that, like, Nolan plays. It's like, dude, just play Nolan. Right? Well, it's like, why? You know, why? Because so, that's a guy they can turn around and make money off of. Yeah, I guess. I guess. I, I, so is Nolan. But, I mean... You know, probably not as easily as a South American. Player. Yeah. Well, that guy's on loan, so they have to buy him first. But um, that's a fair point. Um, we'll come back to that part. You know, I just 
sometimes I don't understand the things they do. Like the, the whole idea of like signing a guy on loan that plays in the exact spot, like your brightest prospect that you currently have plays in. It's just bizarre to me. But they did, you know, and here we are. I mean, I get it on Turk Scott because Turk Scott's out, been out for a year. And this year, is, as we've said, love the kid. And I'm sure everyone around him will say, no, no, he's ready. Yeah, he's ready, but he's not the same. You got to get, he's going to take another year before we'll be back. That's how it is. That's, that's again, the stupid thing with Giovanni and Allen. It's like, I'll be back in August. Sure, but then it takes another year before he's really back. You know, we all know every time. Well, the good news this weekend, uh, 7.30, Seattle comes to town. Dallas, we now officially know, will be wearing their blue afterburner Love it. kits that we've only yeah. seen once all oh season. Oh, my gosh. So, so good. Uh, it would well, look so much better than white Are they? I mean, well, it's better than wearing jersey, the white one yeah. over and over again. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> better than that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was funny the social media account said that we're wearing the kit, not the red kit, because it ain't red. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. If you know, you know, right? Yeah, super glad it's back. You know, put it with white shorts, but, you know, whatever. That's never going to happen. So. All right, so that's what's happening this weekend. Other big news this week is the rumor that was broken, I think, first by The Athletic and other people that uh, – so, by the way, earlier this week, all the MLS bigwigs got together out in L.A. Um, what also just probably not by coincidence happened this weekend was the lawsuit with Relevant – had uh, an update where Relevant let FIFA out of that lawsuit. And on the day that it got announced, um, the big man from FIFA himself, Infantino, Infantino was with all the MLS leaders. Yeah. And I still don't think that that's a coincidence. <laughs> no way. And yeah. out of that came the rumor that the roster rules are undergoing a significant amount of change. As early as this summer window, which seems ridiculous, yeah, and wheels off mid-season. For, yeah, so mid-season. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, given who reported that, people like Carlisle confirming it and stuff. I mean, I'm, it's real. So yeah, it's, sure. Yeah, yeah, they have specific rules. They rules on the athletics. So it's like, yeah. So you want to talk run? about how that affects Dallas, maybe? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, how yeah. much? I mean, look. There's it. The quick read is is there's a lot of opportunity to improve your team very quickly now. And yeah. at the same time, it screams, here are all the other loopholes that will allow the the older owners that don't want to spend a ton of money to continue not to spend a ton of money. Oh, Clark Hunt clearly wrote these. <laughs> yeah, there's no question in my mind that Clark wrote this. Yeah. So number one, it's two buyouts per season, which lets you get out of a bad contract more than you were. So that's good. That right did, Clark did not write that rule. He, he might have because he, that way you can actually get rid of the contract, you know, and move on. But the other part, maybe that one didn't, but the other parts he did clearly in my mind because the biggest change is with has to do with DPs and U22 initiative players. They've made it like now that instead of – it's basically like you just get six and you can have three and three or you can have two and four. And if you only have two DPs, uh, you can take a big chunk of money – and you can convert it into GAM if you want instead. For the rest of your roster. The rest of your roster. The funny money. And the reason that matters for Dallas is because they almost never have players that are over that uh, have to be a DP limit, which is like 1.6 million. So even Jesus is at that line, which means that every DP they have can be bought down to not being a DP. So that lets them get out of having DPs and having more of these U22 guys, which who get paid less, but you pay more to get them and that doesn't go on your cap. And then you can sell them to make money. That's the key part, right? So that's, you know, like we haven't seen Moose's contract yet. His probably will be over the threshold, but Jesus and all and oh, Paul and is. Alan are all right at that threshold. Not a coincidence. Okay. So that's important, right? Well, hold on before you yeah. move on, because I want to make sure we clarify something because sure. the way you said it, made it so you there are six yeah but you can't have six dps it's no, still no, no, a no, limit no, no. of three dps it, it's three and three or it's two and four okay so but yeah. you can't also have six u22s no but you get that chunk like if you have one less dp you get a chunk of money now go, wow. listen it's not in stone could change but you know and you have these young dps and shit i'm sure there's some other minutia in here that we're not aware of yet but at its core you can either go three and three or two and four. And if you go two and four, you get a chunk of money. But the, the reason we care about the two and four at Dallas is because they're set up to take advantage of that. The two and four. 
How and, okay? When you say they're set up to take advantage of that, yeah. In what way will they take advantage of that? Well, because they have the the DPS that don't have this number over one point six million, they can have more U twenty two players who are designed to buy low and sell high. You okay. get more Giovannis, you get more Ennises, you get more, you know. <laughs> Can I tell you, I'm not very yeah. excited already. <laughs> well, that's, uh, if it, that's what we're going to end up getting. Is... It doesn't, it may not help you on the field, <laughs> but if you're trying to make money and you have a TD like Zanata and you're about, you do the hunts, you care about making money. That's why I say Clark Hunt wrote these, right? It while also me while meanwhile also making it easier for the Miamis, Seattle's, and LA's of the world yeah. to bolster their rosters in other ways that actually improve their product yeah. on the field. The way it would help Dallas on the field is that if they do the two and four, they get this chunk of funny money that you can get more of your Paul Ariolas and your Paxtons and your Legettes and these these guys that make you know, under a million dollars. So they're above the DP line, but they're way under the max line. So you can get to where Dallas could carry like six or seven of these guys, like they always like to do, right? Your Reto Ziegler's, your, your um, Facundo's, your, those kind of guys were all over the DP line, but low enough that they would be bought down. So they would allow them to carry more of those guys and make more of their general roster theoretically stronger. Mm. Right. Okay. Help them with, depth and width rather than peak high salary. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does no, that sound absolutely. like the hunts? Sounds like the hunts, doesn't it? <sighs> yeah. I know. I know. Okay, so the next part that sounds like the hunts to me is that they've changed the amount of funny money you can earn by selling and loaning players out. Again, does that sound like the hunts? Sure. So if you sell off your Reynoldses and your Testaments and your whatever else's and your Jesus's, you now get more funny money back to do things with. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it even more sounds like the hunts when you combine that rule with the new, you can have as many homegrowns as you want rule. So Dallas could sign 10 homegrowns and loan out eight of them to all kinds of places you could think of. <laughs> Benfica, USL, whatever and make money on them and put that money into your pocket and into your funny money pile. So again, sounds to me like Clark Hunt wrote that rule. Yeah. So, you know, they're, 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 they're making the rules more flexible, but also giving teams that don't go spend big money on players, more small money to mess with. Or avenues to, to, to yeah. affect their, yeah. More, their, more little piles of the money to do little things with. If you're the Clark, you know, while while loosening some of these stringencies on the other things for your Miamis. And, and, and I will and I will yeah. make the suggestion that this is cleverly written in a manner that a club with a good technical director and a savvy front office staff could build an effective roster with these rules. Think of Columbus. I mean, it's oh. not like Columbus is blowing out, you know. Dude, Garth and Atlanta. Yeah, oh God, well, Atlanta's dude. got a lot of money to play with. But there are clubs that are smart, like Real Salt Lake, Columbus. Um, I'm probably forgetting a bunch Vancouver. of them. Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver, Portland, yeah. maybe, you know, that are going to figure out ways to do this. And uh, and, and so we can, we can joke about how Clark Hunt wrote a lot of these, the problem is I don't know if they've got somebody in the front office to capitalize on it the uh, the way that I believe other clubs will. That's the that's the TBD in this deal. The difference for me is that I think there are some clubs that will take advantage of all these loopholes to try and, and focus only on making their team better, whereas FC Dallas, under the owners we have, will will use part of this or all of it to try and make the team sustainably profitable and survive for – another 40 years and not necessarily win you in the Moss Cup. You just said out loud what I was thinking in my way. I know. I was, I was trying, trying to, to get to it for you. <laughs> I knew what you I, were going I, at. I, well, I was, <laughs> I, I was trying not to be so blunt about it, but yes, exactly. Buzz. Yeah, that's, that's what yeah. it looks like to me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. remember, above all else, the hunts care about sustainability. Yes, well, that's fine. Yeah. But uh, I, I, and I appreciate wanting to be stable and and run a good, smart business. I've never uh, uh, 
begrudge them for wanting to do that. But I also think that there are ways to do that and put a good product on the field. And I look, I, we talked about this last year when things started going south. The, the, I think the most maddening and frustrating aspect about what is going on right now with Dallas is the fact that for is that they are in this awful this awful product on the field right when it feels like they finally after 26 years of being the butt of the 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 the, the butt of the joke of attendance in this league finally got over that hump. They've sold out every game this season, I think, and they'll yes. probably sell out again this weekend. And now what's, what's going on? They got an absolute crap team on the field. And I that know. just, that breaks my heart in some ways. That's uh, really frustrating. I do wonder when it'll hurt the attendance. You know, you, Peter, you and I, you and I had this conversation when the hunts took over this team in late 2002, going into 2003. It's like, Yes, this is the best thing that could happen. The Hunts saved this franchise. It would have been folded. But it's also the worst thing because they're always going to be about sustainability and they're not going to, they're not going to, and they, they claim they are, but actions are what define you, not your words. They don't show the desire to consistently win on the field. They show the desire to be pretty good most of the time. Those are two very different things, you know, mm-hmm. and they, they show more desire to be sustainable and invest in things that get them long term sustainability, stadium, academy. You know, and they're going to do it again here. We've talked about it. So it's it's a, it's a curse and a blessing at the same time. It is what it is. And they're waiting for their moment of luck. Like they almost went in 2010, reinforcing their beliefs. And maybe they're waiting for their Mahomes to come out. You know, they, well, they look, had him and they sold him. For we, 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 we said it last week. 2010, 2016 were anomalies. They were yeah. the exception to the rule. Just in the same way, I believe that this year is an exception to the rule. It, yeah, you know, it is, it is. they're not they're not historically as bad as they have been this season, but they are historically not as good as they were in 2016. Uh, the water will find its level after a certain amount of time. We're just gonna deal. With, we're just in a drought, and yeah. uh, it'll get better. Well, and they time. they have enough talent to be that above average team they always are. It, the question is like, can they get all that talent healthy in time to save this coach's job, or is it going to keep going bad with the injuries and keep going south? And is he going to get fired? You know, that's what we're, you know, even well, if it all got healthy, they're not going to win MLS Cup, but at least yes. it'll be a more enjoyable season. And I'm glad you said that because, and I don't mean to, I don't know how long we've been recording, but I don't mean to drag this out too much longer. But that then opens up the entire can of worms that I thought about earlier this week when I saw uh, Sounder at Heart posted an article about uh, the status of um, Brian Smetzer in Seattle and how hot his seat was. And it dawned on me. It was like, look, Nico's probably not going to make it through this season. I I mean, I I still very much believe he probably is one of the three hottest seats in MLS at this moment. Oh, fair. But when he goes and let's just well, let's play. Let's play this as, as politely as we can. Just working hypothetically that Nico gets sacked this season what the uh, the reality is is that even if bruce arena is out there and let's say in some world brian smetzer is out available dallas is never getting either one of those guys or anybody at that level even if you work under the assumption that any of them would want to take this job because it tends to be a lower paying job the roster right now is an utter disaster the Hunts, the entire time they've owned this team, have they ever hired a well-established veteran manager? No, no. Ever. Once. No. You know, the people that know, you know, around the water cooler tell us that, generally speaking, this is one of the lowest paid head coaching jobs in the league, and it always yes. has been. Yes. And they didn't hire um, Jeffries. They came in after that. And since then, they've hired a former assistant, given his first head coaching job. And Clark, former assistant, given his first head coaching job in Morrow, their family soccer mentor they've known for 30 years. Who had never coached never a pro coached team. Pro team, right? And Shellis. And Shellis. Oscar's the only one when they went out and got him after he had left the academy. And- he had coached two seasons and they had to basically money whip him to get him. You know, but if it hadn't been somebody they believed in heart and soul because he'd been here for 30 years, I don't think they would have done it. Lucci, first head coaching job, first co- job coaching adults. Yes. Right. And he wasn't even coaching at the time they hired him. He, uh, was, he was running the academy. academy. Yeah. Yeah. And now Nico, first head coaching job. So 
even if they were to get rid of him, which I don't think that it would necessarily will, you're talking about a club that will not, you're not going to get Jesse Marsh. You're not getting, you know, you're not going to get Mesh Schmetzer. You're going to get something like they always hire. They always, they always talk about, oh, we have these international names calling. And I know for a fact that at times they've <laughs> interviewed people that are like, that would be great. None of them are ever going to take it because of the fact that you have to deal with Dan Hunt on a daily basis. You have to deal with the team that they already have. Who's going to be doing all that stuff. You're not going to have any control over that. And the job's not going to pay very well. So, you know, I wouldn't be in a hurry to fire Nico. Yeah. The bigger question is like, if you lose to Seattle at home, will he be fired? That's the question. Will he or won't he be? I think if he hadn't got that point, maybe that's enough to help save him if he loses to Seattle. Because if you lose to Seattle at home, I don't know that you're going to hold on to your job. Well, no matter when it happens, um, do you have a, like if somebody just said, Buzz, you got to put a hundred bucks on a bet of who they hire to replace him. Is it Lucene? Who, by the way, has never been a manager before. You want to you want to make the bet now, or do you want to wait and see what happens with the coach? Because I have no, a name. I have a no, name. I, no, I do. Let, let's just call it now. Look, N- Nico's not surviving this season. Okay. I, I I just I there's I just have no sense that this this. Oh I, well, maybe that's too harsh. I maybe I should apologize okay. for saying that. Let's just work under the assumption that Nico gets sacked this season. Who's the guy they replace for fun with? conversation? Yeah. Well. Just for, just for shits and I'm going to give you a name that I think is a hundred percent realistic, both in who they might get and who would take it. Okay. Eric Quill. Whoa. The only coach to ever win a championship at this club period. <laughs> That's awesome. Right. Knows the club probably would take it knowing the club. <laughs> would be willing to take it the money because it would be his first MLS job. I don't even know where Eric Quill is right He's now. He's coaching New Mexico United. Oh, that's right. He went he went from North Texas to go work for uh in Columbus to work for Porter that's for a right. season and then Porter got fired cuz he right. wanted to improve his resume for head coaching. And so after the Porter got fired in Columbus, he came up as a coach for New Mexico United last year. Is Caleb Porter working somewhere right New now? England. New England. Oh, that's right. He went to New England. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So that's my out on a flyer, a guy that would actually take the job. Now, look, if it ever comes down to it, I actually have a list of people I think are legitimate candidates who will consider the job, and we'll do that. But uh, we'll stop with the park cart too far ahead of the horse in terms of Nico getting fired. But yeah, I just well, think, I, since you asked, that's my name. Yeah, I think the the, the main the other reason why I just I thought about bringing this up was is because obviously there's been a, a, more than a fair share of the Nico out brigade out yeah, there. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Which is fair and not necessarily something I agree or disagree with. I just want everybody to take a minute and consider what happens if and when Nico yeah. gets fired because yeah. you don't have an ownership group that's going to go around and hire and replace him with somebody probably even equally as experienced as no. Nico, who, by the way, doesn't have a ton of experience in ML in, in terms of uh, in the scheme of things. And it's not like they're going to go out and hire some veteran big dollar name that's out on the market at this particular, in that no. particular moment. No, you're not going to get special. You're not going to get Morris. You're not going to get, they're not going to go money with Oscar unless Oscar gets fired. They're not going to get Oscar. You know, even if you if they get fired, you might not get him. Um, cause if I want too much money, so you're, you're looking at names like you mentioned Lacine. Yeah. That'll be on the short list. Um, Chewy Vera, the nine, U19 coach here, he'd be on the short list. Um, I think Quill will be on the short list. Michelle. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no, Michelle would probably be the next North Texas coach. Um, you'd have to look at, um, you know, assistance for other teams, you know, the people that have been successful, like who, who's, um, will Wilford Nancy's top assistant, maybe, or, um, other teams that are doing well, you know, a, a guy like who's um, Trondolo's top guy, you know, or who's uh, Vancouver's second coach, things like that. Guys right. that might be looking for their first head job. That's what you're looking at. You know, guys. Where's like Hugo Nico. Perez these days? Cause that's uh, a guy I would kill to have. I think they've interviewed Hugo Perez before. I think I'm pretty sure they have. God, and I they didn't give it to him. You know, is, is he not coaching El Salvador anymore? I don't know. Uh, maybe I think he he's still is. coaching El Salvador. Oh, okay. Possibly, you know. Um, could you include like Zarco, who's had some success, you know, in other countries, you know, 
Lionel oh. Alvarez. Really, I don't think they would that he would want too much money. Um, you know, what would they even cuz he would be it would be about him at that point. Yeah. Um all right, no, we could no, go around and around. Don't, I, I don't want to get too down in the weeds. Yeah, We've already yeah, gone on long enough. Guys, I just want to still head coach here. I mean, it's, you know, I'm just saying that, like, you're right that, like, be careful what you ask for because that's what, unless you like those names, you know, or you're just that much anti Nico, then yeah, you could move, move into that neck of the woods, I guess. So, all right, Buzz. Well, I guess we'll see how this weekend plays out. Um, Seattle, 7 30 Saturday. Is it a theme night this week that I'm unaware oh, of? Oh, yes. It's Military Appreciation Night. Oh, I salute you, Buzz. What do you think? Would you would, would you, do you think Nico gets fired if he loses this game? I want to hear. What I think it depends on how he loses this. I mean, if they get trucked like Seattle trucked, yeah, good point. Uh, Vancouver last it was it Vancouver? Uh, it was to Montreal. They got they beat them five nothing. Yeah. yeah, if they get smoked five nothing here in Dallas, you're probably right. That would be it. Yeah, if it's a close two one late win kind of thing or whatever, uh, Dallas maybe had chances not. Or something yeah, like that. yeah, you know somebody stands on their head, but. Um, I no, think the point they, got him a little room. The point got him a little room. I think. But, yeah, you know, but, but I they, think you're right. Yeah, if they get trucked, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, the hunts. I because I think, dude. I say this last week. You know, we've always said the hunts are really patient and they wait. But often it happens when they get embarrassed. But then I was thinking, like, well, this actually is going back to like the middle of last year. So it's not just the start of the season, really. You're talking about since April of last year that it's been bad. So it isn't. It is a long time. Mm-hmm. They have been patient. Yeah. So. You know, it wouldn't shock me that, uh, as you as you suggest, actually, that's a, probably a good call. That if if they get trucked, that they would, uh, in fact, probably make a move. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. Hmm. All right, Buzz. Thank you very much, my friend. Yeah, thank you for being here, man. I appreciate it. Where's Dan? Where's Dan? Dan's a busy dude, man. He's, I know. He's got so many. Irons he's got like eight in, jobs in the fire. Well, he's, got, he's like five more than me. Uh, beer, like high quality beard products are not inexpensive, Buzz. It's yeah. like it's like having five children. I suspect I all know, the, I know. the bombs and shampoos and all that stuff and the trimming. Mm. Can you imagine the the gear you got to buy to keep that thing in shape? How many razor blades does he go through for his trimmer? I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm sure it's like it's like some sort of commercial grade Ooh, weed whacker week. type yeah. device. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Third Degree, the podcast has been brought to you by Soccer90.com, your one-stop shop for FC Dallas national teams gear, international club gear. They got all the latest U.S. stuff, jerseys, tops, tees, jackets. They got it all. As a Third Degree listener, you get 20% off discount in-store or online, both places. Go Third Degree, 20% off. Go Third Degree, Soccer90.com. Some exclusions do apply. Third Degree, the podcast is also brought to you by the Lindstrom Law Firm for wills, trusts, probates, and business law. Call 469-515-2559. That's 469-515-2559. Or visit the LindstromLawFirm.com for a free consultation. All right. Well, uh, come on back, Dan. Uh, Buzz, thanks again. And thank you, FC Dallas Curious Fan. Keep the faith, everybody. We will speak to you next week on another episode of Third Degree, the podcast. Go burn. Third Degree. The third degree nap podcast. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast.